Welcome to the third installment of the Bayonetta Ball Samus Trifusion. Links to the two prior fusions may be found in the description below. A short explanation for anyone new. I take three existing characters from major franchises, fuse two together in each video to make three new characters in total, and then fuse those three characters together to make one pin ultimate character. Confused? Good. Let's dispense with a frivolity and get to it, shall we? Alright, once again, uh, I will not be commentating on this one as I draw it. Instead, I have already drawn the whole thing and I'm just going to go back over it. After doing a Dark Souls video, I was especially tired so I didn't really want to bother. Uh, the next one, I believe, I will go full out on commentary, which will be the very last one. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, let's see. This one, we are, of course, combining the boss and Samus. First things first, we are going to attempt to figure out a pose. With this one, neither one of them is really like Bayonetta in the sense that they're conveying too much femini femininity. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out a sort of curvy, but at the same time, powerful pose, which is easier said than done. First things first, we have our uh, primary, primary, the first primary, which is just trying to get the rough idea of what the pose should be. Again, with these first ones, I don't really, I'm not too concerned about trying to make it look too different from the originals, because it actually looking somewhat similar really helps out in uh, giving the idea that there are uh, continuations of each design. The final one will be far more original looking. Uh, also, since we're showing off details, this is one thing you'll see in concept art a lot. You're not going to be drawing much many action poses in concept art. Instead, you will be focusing more on picking a pose that shows off as much detail as you possibly can show. And with this one, I am trying to figure out exactly what sort of details I want to include. At first, you're not really going to commit to anything, nor should you. I think even eventually, near the end of the uh, video, once I've almost finished everything, I'm still changing major details. But here, the general idea is I'm trying to figure out how to combine certain elements of both designs. For example, the boss has her big open thing there, which she doesn't have in many cases. And of course, Samus has her big giant pauldron things that don't really make much sense, if you think about it. I don't know why I'm pausing here. Maybe I was masturbating. Who can know? You know who knows? Uh, oh, okay, I was trying to fetch one of these. Yeah, the basic... Okay, uh... The, the core problem with any sort of design is trying to pick a theme, trying to make sense of the actual design. Because you can piece together uh, both designs fairly easily, but it's probably not going to make much sense within the context of its own design. Like, say, the boss is from her own universe, and Samus is from her own universe. But what about our new character? Uh, the new character should be someone that looks like they are from their own universe as well that their own design looks like something that would make sense within the context of their own reality. So whenever you're designing these things, you need to try to pick a general theme behind the design, if that makes sense. With her, with this character, who I'm still not completely certain on the name, I think... I, I pick a name eventually in the context of this video, but I may not even be using the one that you see in the layer names off to the side there. But with this one, I decided rather than uh, go with just a power suit or going with just a kind of stealth suit, I decided to go with sort of a um, modern military concept. Almost a, like, what if, uh, what if Samus... Yeah, the helmet is up really <laughs> overly complex, that little thing, whatever that is. I think it's for holding belts. Um, but I was operating on the context that maybe if, say, Samus, instead of her suit being designed completely like that by the Chozo, uh, maybe if there was a real-world military you know, version of it that existed centuries prior, what would it look like? And I kind of ran with that. 
Uh, here I'm trying to... I think I dropped these... Yeah, I dropped the little collar things right here. I don't stick with that for too long. But again, I'm. this is the third primary layer that I'm going back over. This is more of a detail layer. Uh, the first one was to get the basic pose down, the idea of the pose. second one was to flesh out the kind of principal sort of line work of where everything is going to end up being. And this one is to try to finalize it, which is very difficult, and this is probably going to be the most time-consuming, especially if um, you're not too sure what you're going to end up with. The pauldrons ended up giving me a whole bunch of problems. Again, you can, you can see just from... My secondary line work was uh, flawed in a lot of ways. Uh, even now, I'm just adjusting things over and over again because I didn't place them in the right place. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Samus's design is that her a actual human body could not possibly fit inside of it, the way that it's uh, built. Like, the shoulders are way, way too far apart. Uh, her, you know, bones would have to be completely separated from one another to be able to reach out that far. So, whenever you're going back over, you can't just try to force that kind of idea into... It. Oh, I forgot about that belt line. Oh, well. Uh, you can't just try to force one thing into another. Like, I went back over... You remember I went back over the uh, Metroid design first off? But uh, that's something that you'll have to correct over time. I think even now... I'll go back over this later. This still doesn't look right. The skeleton doesn't behave this way. So eventually I think I end up moving that... Uh, arm that's resting on her hip, I have to move that in a little bit. Which does kind of fuck up something of the, the final design. Get everything right as quickly as you possibly can in the design. You don't want to try to be fixing major flaws in your uh, sort of principal work whenever you're, you know, <laughs> eight hours into the project. Try to work out these boots. I never quite get them right. I mean, they look more or less fine. But I guess since on um, both of the designs, there's not much detail work in uh, Boss's boots, and there's not much detail work in Samus's boots. So I kind of end up just having sort of an area that I'm... Because I'm very detail-oriented. I'm drawing out this gun here, but I don't actually use that. I end up going back over it with a real one. Yeah, go to sleep here. And this is day two. I wake up to disappointment. Yes, I... Was not too happy with this. I noticed immediately that I had uh, skewed the design, drawing it. This is something a lot of people don't know. If you've ever noticed artists kind of doing this, switching back and forth, uh, mirroring the image over and over again, it's because whenever you are drawing, this is especially true if you're drawing on a flat surface, like a table or anything like that. Like, you know, artist boards. Here, I'm drawing the skeleton. Yeah, I'm fixing this already. If you ever notice a, a drawing board, they're always tilted, and that's for a reason. It's not to make it easier to get to. It's because as you draw, you're drawing according to the flat plane that you happen to be seeing. But your body is not positioned straight over that area. It's positioned at an angle. Which may not make any sense to you, but if you think about it long enough, I'm sure it'll make sense. So, whenever you are drawing, it is very, very easy to end up with a tilted uh, design. You will end up uh, having either the the drawing sort of tilting towards you is once you, you know, tilt it back and everything looks normal. Or you will have a situation like this one where you're kind of drawing off to one side accidentally and you end up skewing the whole image slightly to one side. Uh, the advantage of doing a primary versus just doing everything, just straight up drawing over everything, like doing uh, straight tonality work, is that you can, uh, yeah those little cross-section things on the pauldrons make everything look too much like a football uniform. <clears throat> Is that uh, you want to fix that as soon as possible or else you'll end up maladjusting the whole design. And since you're working in rasters, you can easily adjust it whenever you have things like color or uh, finalized uh, line work because then you'll end up uh, causing a lot of uh, dithering on your image. Okay. Here I'm trying to... This take this ends up taking forever. 
but I'm trying all sorts of things to try to make this look a little bit more natural. Because right now I'm trying to... Her, uh, Samus, yeah, her pauldrons. Her pauldrons are the main problem here. I'm trying to figure out a way of incorporating them without making them look too ridiculous. Because he, the, the whole idea behind this design is this is sort of a riot design. Like someone that is sent in to take care of, uh, you know, high, uh, very tense, you know, things, uh, whatever they want to call it. Very dangerous situations in urban environments, whatever. And uh, right now it doesn't look like that. I really like doing uh, sort of d designs that actually look natural. Things that look like they would actually exist in real life. Uh, and sort of right police, you notice right police don't wear armor that looks like fantasy armor where it's all curvy and it's showing off their boobs and, you know, stupid shit like that. Because, uh, it actually has to work. Like, I'll go, I will go into a thing with armor here. I might miss something in the thing. I'm, I'm getting distracted watching this thing. Okay. Here's how armor works. Um... If you ever notice, like, tanks, for example. Tanks have very flat armor strips. You think, how come they don't make it curved? That would make everything bounce off of it. That weakens the structural integrity of the uh, metal that they're working with. Which Sometimes you'll, especially older designs, uh, World War II era designs, I'll try to think of one. Uh, let's see. The T-110 drop concept that never made it to fruition. Uh, T-95, sort of. Although that was more the... Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Uh, but anyways, usually you'll... I'll, I'll explain it this way. Let's say that you have a flat wall and you're shooting a bullet into it. Odds are the bullet is going to go through that flat wall. Um, but what if, say, the wall was tilted very slightly, at like a 15 degree angle? Then the bullet is probably going to bounce off of it, right? And armor sort of works that way. You have to have the armor be at a slight tilt to uh, what the body, body's design is. It has to sort of curve away from the body. Which, especially on female designs of any sort of armor work, this is especially true in, a, like, a armor, medi medieval armor. Uh, you'll notice that people like to design, you know, high finest fantasy armors. Is You know, here are their boobs. Look at their boobs. They're so sexy. But that doesn't work because if someone tries to plunge a sword into this person's chest, that stupid boob armor is going to funnel that blade off her boobs right into her sternum. So that's a really fucking stupid way to design armor. So, like, say, on riot armor, uh, you notice that it's always sort of flat looking, but it's also curved slightly away from the body. That's how you design armor. And in this case, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out a way that to make this look like it looks a little bit natural. I'm still having problems with this fucking pauldron. But it's more this more or less is going to be how it ends up looking. Again, her head is tilted. I, I skewed the shit out of this one. It's such a problem with this design. Maybe I was just drawing I was a bit too relaxed, I guess, on this design. Drawing too much to one side. Adding in these elements here trying to get her visor to work correctly. Because it's hard trying to make this both look like a... <laughs> yeah, I accidentally uh, dropped video. I was using Bandicam and it decided to record on uh, OpenGL mode versus uh, going by a target window. I think I was watching a Star Trek episode at the time, so I ended up just recording footage of Star Trek, which I don't think you want to see. Here I'm starting on the final line work at high resolution, yeah. It's too low. I think the resolution of this one was 2400 by 2400. That is not a good idea. You want to actually be working in something around 8000. You know, that would be best. But unfortunately, uh, the limitations of trying to record this at the same time as working... It, even at 2400 by 2400, I was experiencing a lot of slowdown sometimes. If I ever get a better computer, 
I will be able to actually draw correctly. Putting the face a bit too low, move the face up. Dumbass, thank you. Hmm. Even now, I'm ch still trying to uh, alter some of the basic designs. Something that you want to do whenever you're um, working like this. Don't uh, dis If you have to draw anything that's overlapping on one another, uh, put it to a no new layer. Uh, and then once you have that, cut out what you don't need on the layer below it and then merge everything back down. Here, by the way, this is Paint Tool Psy. I've already answered this question before, but people keep asking it for some reason. Even though people keep explaining it in the comments. I've mentioned it twice. I think I've mentioned it in every video, actually. Uh, but it's Paint Tool Psy. Um, in order to draw straight lines like this, just use the Shift key. Hold down Shift and click, and it'll draw from wherever you last click to wherever you have your mouse pointer at. That's how I'm doing my straight lines so quickly. Curve lines, unfortunately, are not as easy. As I've explained before, uh, this version of Paint Tool Side does not have a circle tool, and it does not have a circle selection tool, so I have to cleverly make my own circle source, which you can see on the side, and then I use that for anything that happens to be curved. It doesn't always work perfectly, though. In order to make a circle, you have to use the shift key to make straight lines like I was talking about, except you also use the home key on your keyboard, which will rotate the canvas default. And that will very, very slowly make a uh, curved line. And eventually it will make a circle. A really terrible looking circle, but a circle nonetheless. Alright, we finally have the helmet done for the most part. Looks somewhat natural. Probably not something an actual soldier would ever use, but whatever. And it does sort of look Metroid-y. Of course, uh, the boss doesn't actually wear a helmet. But, you know, whatever, fucker. She gets a helmet. That's kind of operating the idea that she's more of a classic soldier. So I was going with the idea that this is going to be a classic soldier look. But I'm also kind of putting in uh, fantasy elements. Or not fantasy elements, but things that don't really exist in the real world anymore. Like these fans off the pauldron that you see up top. Uh, that's something that you see in older, you know, like medieval armor things. Because if someone is swinging a weapon and it bounces off your shoulder or it misses your shoulder entirely, then you don't want the blade to continue on and uh, strike the side of your head. So they add in those little bitty fans that keep things like that from happening. How nice of them. Uh, but you also don't want them to be so high that you can't see past them as you turn your head, which is why they're usually not that big. Sometimes on video game armors, you'll see... On video game armors, you'll see so many stupid things happening. Like pauldrons with giant spikes sticking out of them. One, you can't move in something like that. Two, you can't see... Like, if you look to the side, what if someone is approaching from your side, they're about to attack you from the side. You look over to the right, what do you see? A gigantic spike. Oh, how useful. Thank you, Mr. Armor Manufacturer, for that. That really helped me. Now I'm dead. Thank you. Still adjusting these things, though. I kind of fucked up the curves on them. I can see the uh, edges of the uh, raster, which really bothers me. Oh, well. Not everything can be perfect. Especially when it's free, which this is. The, uh, the arms here. Yeah, I, I still kind of fucked up the arms. I don't think I'd catch it right here, though. The arms are still way too far out. Maybe I'll keep them like this. I may, I may have just cheated. Yeah. Whenever you're... I, I was trying to incorporate boss's little, uh... Damn it, Huggles. Uh, Steam Alerts showing up. I was trying to incorporate these little things, the little sort of strap works that goes in between the uh, seams in her fabric. I ended up dropping the idea completely, though. Instead, going with these little things. I love doing those. If you ever see those in a lot of drawing, it's, it's, it's one of my little call signs. I love doing little... Sort of Akira Toriyama sort of does that, too. You know, like Piccolo, Dragon Ball Z. 
He's got those kind of dumb little pink stripe things all over his body. And a lot of Akira, Akira Toriyama's designs, he has those things all over the place. They don't serve any function. They just sort of break up the design visually. I couldn't be... It's not something you want to teach to other people, though. Everybody has their own little, you know, cute little details that they tend to include in everything. A lot of the times you won't even notice them. But everyone has them. It's okay to have them, but don't try to force them in everything you draw. Otherwise, you're just an irritating prick and your design lead is going to hate you for doing it. Not everything needs a mesh on the joints. Let's see. These don't really look natural for the armor that I'm designing here until I get to the color work. Once I start working in color, then it starts looking more or less alright. Looks okay. I fuck up the gloves here. For some reason, I added in that, you can see it in the primary, that uh, almost vertical line, It goes. I'm drawing it right now, that I don't know where I got that from. Because the boss doesn't have it, and Samus doesn't have it. I think I just added it in just because I wanted to break up the way that the gloves actually look. But eventually, once I start the color, this is one of the things I changed late, a little bit too late for my taste. I end up getting rid of it and changing it to, I think, a bar on the, uh, a bar on the upper sort of forearm. A lot of this, especially this, because the legs again, uh, there's nothing really special going on down here. It's kind of the dullest part of the work. You really have to force yourself to keep going whenever you get to something like this. If you don't enjoy certain areas of the drawing, it can be really difficult to get through it. For people that actually... It, industry artists, that's what they're called. For industry artists who do industrial work. Uh, industrial work is... If you've ever seen concept art of a video game that looks sort of messy, it's sort of geometric, but it looks like it was done very quickly but it com looks very atmospheric. That is called, that is industry work. Uh, it's industrial labor. It's, you have to go to a special type of school to get you, to teach you exactly how to draw that way. It's uh, meant for producing drawings as quickly as possible. Um, and it's also meant to standardize the way that uh, concept art looks. Like, have you ever noticed that uh, film concept art and, uh, video game concept art kind of looks the same. That's, you know, that's intentional. Uh, it's because, it's to make sure that since these guys that are doing this work, they, they don't stay with one company. They go from company to company over and over again, and they need to make sure that the artists more or less look the same. So that whenever they present it uh, later on to the public, then it looks standardized to the work that they're doing. Uh, that's industry work, yay. Um, but when, I don't even remember why I even brought this up, but <laughs> whenever you're doing industry work, you're, uh, dis, uh, oh, oh, that, that's why, uh, industry artists, whenever they do this, usually they will start their primaries in the morning. Uh, they will do, I think, like three or four different ones early in the day, and they, they don't even really look like this exactly. They'll, they'll kind of have a loose line work. Uh, it won't even be this tight. It'll be more tonality. It'll be more geometry versus uh, detail-oriented work. And they'll do those early in the day because early in the day, you're not quite as insane. Uh, later on, as time goes on, as you've been drawing all day long, you just get fucking sick of it. And at that point, you you know start listening to podcasts or watching video or you know anything that you can just listen to. And uh, at that point, you're just mainly doing uh, colors and things like that. You don't really have to think too much about it. Whereas line work, you really have to think, and it's really uh, mentally draining. Of course, being raised on a farm, I'm quite aware of the differences between office work and actual physical labor. 
I think I've probably actually probably done more physical labor than this sort of office work in my lifetime, just from having to do uh, like a assembly line bullshit. Don't work on assembly lines, kids. They will give you health problems. But there's a major difference between the two of them. Physical labor, physical labor is easy in the sense that you don't really have to think about anything. I'm finally incorporating the Patriot here. I'm going to try to turn this into an arm cannon. But physical labor is very different from uh, mental labor. Mental labor in many ways is a lot more exhausting. They're two completely different things though. Because with any sort of mental labor, like writing, like I've tried writing novels before I started doing animation work. Uh, that's very... Like, you, you, you obviously always have to be on top of your game whenever you're writing. Or whenever you're doing, you know, this sort of thing, whatever. Uh, you always have to be thinking, you always have to be creative. I mean, you can't just write and then stop writing and just write garbage for the next five hours and then say, oh, it's a day, and then go back over it. And then the next day you realize, oh, this was really, really awful. There is sort of a primary work in writing, though. I'll mention that for a second. Whenever you're writing, this is a completely different subject. This is something I would really... I'm going to do a let's gripe about writing one day. Probably not soon, though. But whenever you're doing writing, a lot of the times what you can do is just try to get yourself into a stream of consciousness sort of mode where you're more focused on ideas. Oh, god damn it. A problem with me is that I, I, I start thinking about too many things at the same time while I'm commentating here. And I distract myself because I'm trying to say too many things at the same time. Uh, but as... Whenever you're doing any sort of preliminary writing work, what you want to do is start with a sort of loose skeleton of how everything works. Uh, like, say, you want this character to go, to go through this arc, you want to accomplish, you know, these certain things, and, you know, so on, things like that. And, uh, once you do that, you can just sort of lay out a skeletal sort of framework for your writing where you are just, you know, Bill said this, Bill did this. And it, it kind of just keeps going on like that, where it's not really prose, it's just sort of these things happen. And then that will be your sort of primary, I guess you would say, for that chapter. And then, you, then after that you go back over and then you start thinking about things like theme, uh, things like... Uh, how exactly to link everything together with prior chapters. You know, just, it, it's really fucking complicated. But that at least, you can at least uh, sort of do your primary work before then, which sort of makes it an inverse of drawing. Drawing, you want to do everything that's complicated first, and then you wear yourself out and then just kind of pit along. I'll mention this in a second. Um... But in writing, is the inverse. You want to start with the most basic stuff first that you don't really have to think too much about. Well, actually, you want to start with the things that you want to think a lot about, and then you want to start... Then, once you actually start the writing, then you, uh... Oh, God damn it! I'm thinking about too many things. I'm trying to name. Yeah. No, none of... Those are all terrible. Later. Yeah. You start with the sort of loose idea then you start no you start with the core concepts and then you when you whenever you start writing then you do the skeleton work and then whenever you finish the uh, sort of you finish that you go back over it and try to do as much as you can uh, unifying everything okay and I was going to say about the gun um, I drew the lines too thick because I was using the uh, shift little line trick and that makes all the lines look their maximum thickness, whereas when using a tablet, it makes them uh, however much thickness that you're applying the pressure with. So I ended up having to put that to its own layer, use the wand tool to select everything that wasn't there, and then I used the increment tool to bring the selection down so that I could delete a little bit from every area. 
and that reduced the line thickness of all that since I fucked that up. Okay, now I'm starting the color sort of zoning. Um, visor presents a bit of a problem because it's going over everything else. I think I end up upping the saturation and uh, darkening it and then lowering the opacity. That way I get a nice even blend. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Lord. Guys, I swear, you have... You, you, I think especially women would have this problem. Anyone with artistic, sort of an artistic mind, anyone with uh, whatever side of the brain it is, right or left, I think it's... I think it's right. I can't remember. But the side that isn't mathematics. If you are cursed with a brain like this, oh, Lord. It is such a chore to try to explain anything to anyone while you're watching something. Because you start thinking about all sorts of things at the same time. And especially if you internalize things, like if you're someone that doesn't really... Like if if you're someone that's very introspective and you don't really communicate much with other people, then you end up thinking mostly to yourself all the time, so you don't really need to explain things. The brain takes mental shortcuts in all things. Like, for instance, if you take a word and then jumble the letters and try... You've probably seen this online before. Where you, you'll read a whole paragraph, but it's a bunch of jumbled letters. But you still see the words. Because your brain is taking mental shortcuts over and over again. For someone that internalizes things, for someone... Usually this is true of artistic people. Your brain does this a lot. So you end up sidetracking yourself because you're trying to say something in as clear a fashion as possible, but at the same time your brain is trying to take shortcuts you don't want it to take. And you're also thinking about two or three different things at the same time. Yeah, colors will change. I don't keep this. Don't worry, guys. I do keep the hair color and most of the, the face color, although it changes a little bit after I'm doing the shading. But I say that's especially true with women, because women tend to, uh... It's not emotional versus rational, which is sort of the cliche that's not really true. It's more cyclical thinking versus linear thinking, which may sound like the same thing to you, but it is most assuredly not. Uh, whenever you're doing your color, make sure that you're doing it in a dark color. That way you don't miss anything. You notice all these little bitty white spots, especially if you're doing wand tool stuff. Yep. Then afterwards, you can just, uh, uh, shit. Stop thinking, Eli. Uh, you can j uh, just go back over it with the solid color that you wanted to use to begin with. So, yeah, ta-da. Okay. But women tend to think more in terms of things that, it, how things relate to one another. Which is why whenever, you know, your girlfriend or you, if you're watching this and you are a girlfriend, yay, whatever, uh, will start complaining about their mind going a mile a minute or uh, they can't get anything done because they or they lie awake in, in bed all night because they start thinking about one thing and then they start thinking about another that's because women and you know some guys and so on tend to think cyclically versus linearly which means they think in terms of their brain organizes things in terms of their relationship with other things which guys if you've ever had problems with uh your girlfriend bringing things up that happened years and years ago that, you know, don't seem to be related to the conversation at all. It's because their brain pulled it up. It was a little cue card, and their brain said, hey, remember this? This is related to this. Whereas a guy, or, you know, just some women, they don't really think this way, of course, uh, will tend to think in a bit more of a uh, linear fashion in it's this thing, and I remember this happened in this sequence of events, and, you know, it, it just kind of goes on like that. Smarter people than I have probably written books on the matter. It's really interesting, though. Okay, you see here, I am fucking with this color palette. Uh, Balsa's pure white and Samus's very bright orange and red don't go well together, so I ended up pulling up her old model sheets. And I don't know, which, which game is this from? Uh, 2007. Okay, one of the Metroid Primes, 2007. I ended up going with this color palette. And adding in a little bit of white to try to unify it with... See? These gloves. Yeah, you fucked it up early, buddy. 
I fucked up the gloves early, so I'm going to have to go back and change this. Anyways, I used that 2007 color palette, which looks really nice. I actually really, I, I really like uh, subdued uh, tones. I don't like bright colors. I'm a very autumn person. Mm. If you ever see me on the streets, I'm undoubtedly an autumn. But I end up using that. Uh, the the fact that it's gray really works well with uh, Boss's color scheme as well. Balls's. By the way, Boss Balls. That's how I say them. Just a heads up. See, I finally changed this. Add in the black. Come on, add in. It's a belt. It's a belt, asshole. Put it in. Ugh. I must do it later. But these little glowy things sort of make a little bit more sense now. Because now we're moving away from it being a sort of riot officer design. And it looks a bit more like a... Uh, Sort of a futuristic sort of thing going on. Uh, don't ask me what the hell those lights, what purpose those serve. Not everything can be perfect, kids. The lights don't make much sense. Because, you know, they, if you're trying to do anything stealth related, oh, what's that in the distance? It looks like some asshole with giant glowing pauldrons. Well, better shoot them, and they're dead. Yep. For some reason, I'm really enamored with the, uh,. You see the, on her arms, those color bands, those sort of, uh, sepia colored to uh, bands on the side of her arm. I love that for some reason. I don't know, just doing color work, zoning things out is one of the most satisfying things you can do. I love doing it. Doing the black hair ended up, uh, for some reason all of, uh, Samus's designs, all, all of her guns are sort of a green color. It's really weird. But I, I end up uh, going back and uh, changing that. Oh, look what I'm doing here. I got so used to it. Yeah, it's not Bayonetta. No, she's not even in this one. Mm -mm. See, I got so used to doing that on all the other designs, I just started doing it. Because Bayonetta's uh, gun has those weird, you know, sort of gem-looking things all over the place. Which is good news for me on this design, which means I don't have to do so much detail work. Because Bayonetta's gun has an insane amount of, uh, like, lines and color and everything going all over the place. Sometimes with some designs, the most fun that you can have is going to be the line work, and then after that, the color becomes a chore. On uh, some others, it will be zoning out the colors. Yeah, I fucked up the, uh, the way that the gun is angled here. Ended up just dropping this entirely. Oh, that's really irritating. But on some, some, on some of the designs, it's going to be uh, zoning out the color, which is what I'm doing. What, which is what I've been doing here for the past twenty minutes or whatever. Actually, I think this. I don't know how long this. I'll have to look it up later. After I do the outro. But I think this one took a little bit less time than the last one, but still something like uh, seven or eight hours. It's almost the same. But the either the line work can be fun or the color zoning can be fun. I think the most fun on this one is the color zoning. Or the shading can be fun. The most fun part of the design. Whenever you're, you're kind of doing things for yourself, try to leave yourself as much room as possible to have as much fun as you possibly can. Because you don't want to tie yourself out uh, doing the line work. But don't get over detailed with that. Uh, don't get over detail with your uh, shading. Of course, this may just be my style talking. Like, I kind of have this... I sort of have this style where it's really detail-oriented, but at the same time, there's not much detail. Like, I don't obsess over it. <clears throat> and, uh... These sort of... Uh, it's not too painterly as far as the... Painterly as far as the... Uh, uh, color goes, but there's a lot of shading at the same time. And I don't go super high on contrast, because then you can't see the details. Which I could very easily make half of this... You know, like Sin City is a good example. Where anytime you see a drawing, half the damn thing is black. I forget what that's called exactly, but that sort of high contrast work. Where your shadows are very, very black. You can easily do that. It looks really good, too. 
I mean, I really like the look of it, but whenever you're doing concept work, you don't want to do it. It may look impressive, but your modeler is going to come back later and say, I can't use this because I can't see anything that's supposed to go on the model. And then you have to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm an asshole. I was just doing it because I enjoyed doing it. A lot of people uh, paint differently, so you'll have different processes. Like for me, it's uh, primary, primary again, primary over that. Then uh, line work, finalized line work. Then color base. Then uh, what I'm doing here, shading, followed by uh, working up tonality using a shine layer, which you're really not supposed to do, but I do anyways. And then using an extra layer to go back over and add detail work. A lot of other people will not even use line work. They'll just start drawing with uh, tones. Like they'll do a grayscale image, and then they'll go back over it with color. Or maybe some people just use straight color and just start drawing with color that way. I really don't like doing that because I'm a bit too messy. Like doing line work this way is the only way that I can force myself. Maybe someday I'll do a speed drawing of a... Uh, the straight tonality. It'll end up looking a little bit more realistic because that's how things look in real life. They're tones, they're not lines. Uh, but here I'm just trying to figure out what exactly where the light source is coming from. Whenever you're doing your shading, if you're doing it this way, uh, stay true to wherever your lighting is coming from. Like in this one, I'm assuming that the lighting is coming from the uh, sort of upper uh, left hand corner, I guess. So all the shadows are being cast down to this side. Sometimes I don't obey that rule, though. Because uh, you still have to show off the details. So don't be a slave to it at the same time. I mean, it's you're not drawing a fucking photograph here, guys. I mean, that's the point of doing things via drawing them or whatever. It's so that you... Uh, can uh, cheat and show things the way that they aren't in real life. Like, people really, especially on the internet, get really enamored with uh, realistic drawing. Which usually amounts to doing what I'm doing here, except you uh, take textures from the internet, like skin textures and metal textures, and just apply them to the thing in Photoshop. And, oh, realism. Uh, there's a lot of bad artwork that kind of looks still good because it's using <laughs> good textures. But anyways, uh... Oh, what the hell was I saying? I got myself sidetracked again. Mmm! But anyways, it's... uh, Whenever you're doing straight tonality, tonality work, it's easy to get obsessed with realism. But the thing about drawing is... Like, I could take a, a photograph into Photoshop and use the drop tool to sample each individual pixel of that photograph and then redraw each individual pixel, you know, over the process of years of work to make a quote-unquote photorealistic drawing. But that doesn't prove anything. That's a waste of time. The whole point of doing a drawing is to add your own style to it, not to do realism. I mean, it's, in, it's, it's a nice project to be able to uh, do, re, do realism, to try to be able to pull it off. I mean, I st still, from time to time, kind of dick around with it. But in the end, you're not really accomplishing much of anything. I mean, it's one thing if you're doing, like, there's a guy that does uh, realistic... He, he has a deviant art. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he's famous... Damn it, Huggles. But uh, he's famous for like those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle things where they look realistic. He drew April, he drew all the turtles, he drew Splinter, he drew Shredder. You've probably seen them before on the internet. And uh, it's one thing if you're doing things like that, where it's something that you see in sort of a cartoon thing, and you want to see them portrayed realistically, that's fine. But if you're doing things like, I'm going to draw a uh, realistic landscape, or I'm going to draw... Uh, you know, the President of the United States, realistically, you know, why? You know, why are you even wasting your time? Just take a, a fucking photograph. I mean, if you want something realistic that is already real, just take a photograph. Especially since most of the people that do these quote-unquote realistic 
uh, drawings are using uh, photographs as their base anyways. They're either doing matte paintings or they are uh, at least uh, heavily sampling an original photograph. So what's the point? Anyways, that's my personal thoughts on that. I'm sure there are plenty of people that are absolutely obsessed with realism. It's especially a problem in the United States. North America in general. Because uh, whenever uh, whenever everyone was coming over from Europe especially, uh, Europe was going through this really big... Uh, I can't even remember the ages anymore. I haven't had to remember them since college. But uh, they were going through, sort of, you know, they were going through, through the Victorian age, and uh, Baroque was still, you know, the heritage of Baroque and, you know, its an ancestors and so on were still very much in power, and people were obsessed with realism. Because remember, there were no photographs. So whenever you wanted to portray something, you wanted to portray it as realistically as possible. Because the idea was that the epitome of oh yay starting the uh, shine work because the, the the epitome of art was trying to get as close to the original as possible that's a very uh, a very old concept goes as far back as like Socrates and Aristotle and things like that old Greco Roman bullshit where they were obsessed with uh, truth and they considered being able to portray which is up you know you see, like, uh, ancient sculptures. They look really damn realistic. And that's because they were trying to get as close to the actual human body as possible. Because they consider it to be a high form of uh, art. Although, I shouldn't call it art. Because the modern conception... Is this art? Is it art? That didn't exist until very, very recently. Like, that's a modern invention. <clears throat> Uh, that problem did not exist until kind of the late 1800s. Then it became a huge fucking problem. I think my thesis paper in uh, in college was... <laughs> she wanted us to uh, write, what is art? To You know, that was our final thing. You need to write a paper on what art actually is. Which the, the point of that class is not to prove, prove what art is. It's to try to present a good argument. You, know, you can say that art is, you know, dog poop. But, you know, as long as you present a really good argument as for why it's dog poop, I mean, you'll still get an A in the course. You're not trying to prove it, you're just trying to present a very good argument for it. But anyways, my final thing was, I hate the word art. Because, oh, th this is such a, this is another, let's gripe about art. That, that's something I'll eventually have to do. Uh, but the idea is that the mo this modern conception of is this art? Is it art? It's it's usually code for am I impressed by the thing that I'm looking at? And that's all people know. If you ever sat in a uh, like a an art theory class in college, it will not take you long to be absolutely horrified by the opinions of everyone around you. People have a lot of fucking stupid opinions. Me, one of them. Haha. <laughs> But the problem with a lot of these things is that people have this internalized conception of what art is, but they never really think about it in term logically. Like, they never actually sit down and think about the rules that they're think thinking up for themselves. So whenever they're forced to try to prove it in a public setting, it absolutely falls apart, and it is a train wreck. And a lot of it is because whenever people are designing things. They're not thinking about it in terms of arts. Like if you're doing a graphic design of, you know, bathroom stall people, you know, stick figures. You're not doing it to try to this is the art. That I'm, do I'm holding out my hand in a flourishing fashion, by the way. Oh, art. We're to find the artistic meaning of how people poop and genders. No, they they're, they're just trying to portray it in a way that everyone can understand. Oh, this is a guy and this is a girl. And that's it. That's all they give a shit about. And a lot of times people are drawing a picture because they want to make a political statement. And that's it. And people try to assign this global value of what art is or isn't. By trying to incorporate every, every person's motivation ever at the same time. Sometimes people have motivations that don't even work out. Like maybe I'm trying to 
draw a picture for uh, for the sake of some sort of political motivation, but uh, that is lost entirely. And I fail completely to instill, you know, that in the uh, viewer. So that failed completely. But at the same time, people pick up on it for different reasons, and it ends up becoming a pop culture thing. And uh, in that sense, it becomes art in the public eye, despite the fact that the original artist failed and whatever his intent happened to be. And my point in uh, my little thesis paper thing that I ended up doing for senior design was that uh, you should talk more about, less about whether something is art, which is just bullshit, and talk more about what the motivations of the thing was to begin with, the history of it, and what uh, effect it ended up having. Like, what its actual effect is. And if you do that, then you're... You're having a lot, mo a lot more of a... A lot more success talking about whatever it is that you're talking about versus just being a dick and saying, It's art! That's why I hate the word art. Because people get too hung up on this inter internalized perception that they have created themselves... And they're not actually arguing about the thing anymore. They're just arguing about their personal feelings that they have developed over years of being told what art is or isn't. Art is a really fascinating thing that is a cultural creation that has no basic definition because people learn it as they age. Because they're appointed to something and they say, and someone says to them, this is art. And as a little kid, that doesn't mean anything to them. So they just memorize various things, and usually it's something like realism. Like, this is realistic, so it has to be art. So a lot of people grow up, in America especially, being told, oh, this is high art because it's being portrayed as real realistically as possible. So they ended up with a distorted worldview of the success of something based on uh, how realistic it ends up being, which isn't the case. If you want to be... If you want to have a good conversation about something... Just think about what its impact on you personally is, and then talk about that. Because that's where the value of any sort of art is. It's in your impact on... Video's over, by the way. It's on the impact that it has on you as a person. Okay. Okay, uh, final thoughts on this design. I actually got through the whole video talking. Isn't that amazing? My voice does not feel good right now. <coughs> I probably won't be able to talk for quite a while. All right, final thoughts on this design. I actually like this one quite a lot. I kind of imagine that, again, people are going, she's not sexy enough, draw boobies. No, I, I don't do that. Uh, I, I Well, actually, I do do that, obviously, but I actually really value things like this a lot more. It's probably because, I, I don't know, it's a weird duality with me. So whenever it comes to comedy, I like to focus on sexuality and things like that because I find it kind of funny. But when it comes to actually designing things, I like to focus more on things like this. Like, if, something, if I consider something to be fun, I guess I'll start playing with uh, sexuality and things like that. But whenever it comes to actually something that's serious, I'll get a lot more detail-oriented and make things a lot more <laughs> realistic-looking. More functional. Functional. Because you might be complaining, Oh, you do realism! Uh. No, I mean, it's fine to have things that are fun. But at the same time, when it comes to design, that's just, that just happens to be how I design. I design for functionality, but at the same time, I appreciate uh, a lack of realism in some ways. I know, it's... The thing about any form of uh, opinion in life is that it's not as easy as just writing it down in a sentence. It's give and take with all things. But anyways, uh, that's what gets <laughs> politicians into trouble all the time. The color palette on this actually worked out pretty well. I think it's actually... It's probably evoking a bit more of Samus than I want. Because, again, uh, the boss actually doesn't have much going for her aside from the fact that it's a stealth suit. But that's not coming through much because, again, metal meets cloth. What do you do with that? You can't do much of anything with it. But actually, it's more... I'm not conveying too many of the details of boss's design. Balls's design balls so much as I'm trying to capture the spirit of her 
Because she is a hardened veteran, she's a soldier, and I'm kind of reducing Samus' design into that. And I think also the, you don't see much of the face in this one, obviously, but I think uh, there's a bit more of uh, the Joy, maybe I should just call her the Joy. Uh, that's her prior name before taking the name of the boss, by the way. Um, there's probably a bit more of her in the face on this one. Then there is, uh, as far as, uh, whatever her, I don't know, Samus's, Samus's design is. Because Samus, to me, doesn't really have that much of an interesting face. She just, she's just kind of generic. Like Bayonetta also has a very pretty face. But it's not stereotypical. She, she, her face is very angular, and it's very, it's very distinctive for her. Whereas Samus, it's like they just took off her mask, and it's like, eh, this. She's she's a supermodel. She's pretty, whatever, and that was the end of it. I like uh, faces that have a bit of distinctiveness to them. It's it's difficult to get a face, especially a feminine face, that looks distinctive but at the same time is appealing, because it's really easy to make a very angular, very ugly face, but it's kind of difficult to make something that looks sort of atypical as far as beauty goes, but at the same time does look beautiful in its own right. Uh, with her, I think I kind of pulled it off, more or less. The final combination of all three of these is going to be... It's going to be a problem, but it, I think it's also going to be fun. Now that I've said that, it, pray, it may end up going horribly wrong. Hmm. A couple of final things on this. The gun, it doesn't look like she can actually bend her elbow using this gun. While I was doing it, I was kind of imagining that the parts that are kind of attached to her upper arm would actually be sliding down into the rest of the gun... But something like this would never work in real life. I mean, the idea of a gun that slides onto your arm, it's, it's a cute idea, but it's not really functional. Both because you can't fit many components inside of it, uh, and because it's probably not a good idea to have a gun welded onto your arm all the time. Because if you need to quickly interact with anything, or if you need to drop the gun, or something like that, or maybe you need to swing your wrist to one side to gain even more flexibility in your aim. You can't do it because there's a gun welded to your forearm. You don't do that. So, anyways. Uh, the final design coming up will be a combination of Bayonetta, the boss, and Samus Aran. And, actually, it's not going to be a combination of those three. Uh, it's actually going to be a combination of these three. Which will be... Uh, whatever their names are. Aeronetta, I think, was one. And Balsonetta, and whatever this one's name is. You'll find out by the name, by the end of the thing. I actually came up with a really good one, but I was thinking about saving it for the very last one. Which may or may not come as a surprise. I forget what I was calling this one in the video, but, you know, whatever. We'll find out later. Alright, guys, I will see you in the final video. These are my final thoughts, and my voice is very tired. Time to go kill myself, and probably feed the cats and the chickens, because I probably haven't done that yet. Okay, see you then.